Harper Audio presents How to Get What You Want and Want What You Have Written and read by John Gray The real challenge in life is continuing to want what you have even after you get what you thought you wanted. Many people have learned how to get what they want, but then they no longer enjoy it. Whatever they get is never enough. They always feel as if they're missing something. At the other end of the spectrum, there are those who are much more content with who they are, what they do, and how much they have. Yet, they just don't know how to get more of what they want. Their hearts are open to life, yet they're still not making their dreams come true. They do their best, but wonder, why do others have more? Personal success is the middle ground, the place from which you get what you want, but you also continue to want what you have. Personal success is not just outer success, measured by who you are, how much you possess, by what you've accomplished. Instead, personal success is measured by how good you feel, how good you feel about who you are, what you've done, and what you have. Personal success is within our grasp, but we must first clearly know what it is and set our intention to have it. Personal success requires a clear understanding of how to create the life you want. Achieving personal success does not have to be left to chance, destiny, luck, or good fortune. Applying one or two of the new insights in this recording can literally change everything overnight. Although circumstances may temporarily be the same, the way you look at your life can change in an instant. As you achieve personal success, life ceases to be a struggle. What was difficult becomes easier. Life still has its problems, but you'll be more successful in solving them. Doors that seem locked will begin to open. Life's inevitable challenges will become opportunities to make you more powerful. Personal success is not some imaginary state of grace devoid of conflict, disappointment, frustration. A big part of mastering personal success is learning how to transform negative feelings into positive feelings and negative experiences into lessons learned. Achieving personal success means that when you fall down, you know exactly how to get back up. The secret of personal success is staying in touch with your inner peace, joy, love, and confidence while you're in the flow of life. When you feel confident that you can get what you want, then you're less restless. You accept that life is a process, and you understand that it sometimes takes a lot of time to get what you want. The unrealistic expectation for life to be perfect drops away as you discover that you can attract and create in your life exactly what's perfect for you. Many people have achieved a lot in their lives, but they lack peace. The world is filled with unhappy millionaires who can't sustain loving relationships. Yet they and those who emulate them continue to think that more money or more of something will finally help them feel good about themselves and their lives. As we all really know, money can't buy happiness or love. Even though this concept is very familiar, it's still easy to get caught in the web of illusion that outer success can make us happy. The more we think that money is capable of making us happy, the more we give away our power to be happy without it. As you hear this, some part of you is probably thinking, yeah, I know that money can't really make me happy, but it sure can help. Although this thought is reasonable, it's important to recognize that it's a misconception that robs you of your power. The experience that money makes you happy or that others can make you happy is truly an illusion. Let's explore for a moment what I mean by illusion. At this exciting time in history, many illusions are being recognized. For example, in the relationships between men and women. I'm always asked, why didn't someone write men are from Mars, women are from Venus before? It's all so obvious. It just seems like common sense. People today are beginning to accept as common sense 
that all major religions can teach the truth and yet be different. As we enter this new millennium, it's now becoming common sense that the paths are many, but they all lead to the same place. And as we can see the wisdom in all religions, we're then able to appreciate the wisdom and truth in our own personal path even more. With all these advances in common sense, a new door is being opened for mankind. We're now capable of debunking other illusions, the illusion that the outer world is responsible for how we feel, the illusion that outer success has the power to make us happy. Just as happiness disappears with the belief that we can't be happy without more, joy begins to last longer when we believe and regularly experience that our happiness is not dependent on outer circumstances. As a teacher for more than 25 years, I've witnessed this shift, the capacity to comprehend how we alone are responsible for our feelings is now within everyone's reach. With this one simple but important insight, the secrets for creating personal success can be finally comprehended and applied by all and not just a few fortunate ones. The inherent promise of all external success is an illusion. When we're unhappy, we think a new car, a better job, or a loving partner will make us happier. Yet with each acquisition, the opposite effect is achieved. Initially, getting what we want appears to work. But after a short period of happiness, we're unhappy once again. As before, we mistakenly believe that having more will make us happy and take away our pain. Unfortunately, each time we look to outer success for fulfillment, we feel more emptiness inside. External success can only fulfill us if we're already in touch with our inner positive feelings. Personal success comes from within and is achieved when you're not only able to be yourself, but love yourself as well. It's feeling confident, happy, and powerful in the process of doing what you want to do. Personal success involves not just achieving goals, but feeling grateful and satisfied with what you have after you get it. Without personal success, no matter who you are or how much you have, it will never be enough to make you happy. To find true and lasting happiness, we must make a small but very significant shift in our thinking. We must make achieving personal success and not material success our number one priority. If you're wanting more and you're already happy and confident inside, then wanting more and engaging yourself in the process of getting more creates waves of joy, love, confidence, and peace. It's natural to want more love in our relationships. It's good to want more success in our work. It's normal to enjoy the pleasures of the senses and to want more. Why not? Wanting more is our natural state. Wanting more and having less is not the cause of our unhappiness. The real cause of unhappiness is the absence of joy. Unhappiness is similar to darkness. The way to remove darkness is simply turn on the lights. Likewise, our unhappiness in life automatically lessens as we learn to turn on the light within ourselves. In literature and in the movies, there's often stories of people who achieve success by selling their souls to the devil or to the dark force. Although these stories are fictional, there's actually a lot of truth to this metaphor. It's much easier to achieve outer success if you give up who you are. Selling your soul or selling out simply means making outer success more important than your soul's desire to be loving, joyful, and peaceful. Many people have achieved great worldly success by not being loving. Unencumbered by the needs of others, they can ruthlessly move ahead. History is abound with powerful and corrupt people who have achieved fame and fortune 
by abusing, neglecting, and stepping on others. Although their lives may have appeared prosperous and fulfilled on the outside, they were impoverished inside. On the other hand, the opposite approach doesn't work either. Some choose to be true to themselves, but often miss out on achieving outer success. They follow their hearts, they follow their bliss, or they go with the flow. Being true to yourself can make you happy, but it doesn't ensure getting what you want. If we're to live the life we're intended, we must give ourselves permission to want more. If you're one of those who just doesn't care about money, it's good to reevaluate that feeling. You may unknowingly be blocking your inner desire for more. Sometimes when we don't get what we want, we deal with disappointment by denying our desire. Rather than feel our inner pain, we can avoid it by saying things to ourselves like, it wasn't that important, or I didn't really care anymore. This common tendency can eventually numb our feelings and prevent us from feeling our natural desires. In my 20s, I went through a phase of rejecting the outer measures of success. After living as a monk in Switzerland for nine years, I eventually found God and discovered a tremendous source of internal happiness. To a certain degree, I had renounced my need for outer success. Yet I still wanted to make a difference in the world, and I prayed, asking God to show me the way. It had taken me about nine years to go inside to find my true self and my connection to God. Coincidentally, after taking about nine years to find myself and God, it took about another nine years to attract and create everything I had wanted in the outer world. Then, after another nine years, I was able to create success beyond my highest expectations and dreams and develop the practical insights and tools for others to achieve their dreams much faster. As I look back at my own personal journey, I see many wrong turns and mistakes. Yet these mistakes were necessary for me to find my way. Fortunately, I had enough love and support in my life to learn from those mistakes. After suffering deprivation, I gave myself permission to ask for more. Eventually, after asking God to show me the way, I learned that I could ask God for anything, not just for love and peace and joy, but I could also ask God to show me the money. Even today, although I love the comforts and trappings of outer success, I travel around the world and sometimes live as a native in underdeveloped areas. Missing the simple comforts of our Western lifestyle keeps me from taking it for granted. Primitive living protects me from losing my appreciation for what I have. Let there be no doubt that the quest for money is hurting the world, but don't forget the reason why. Material abundance or the desire for it is not the problem. Outer success is only the cause of unhappiness when we make it our primary focus and neglect being true to ourselves. With an understanding of how to create personal success, you can experience both inner and outer success. When we're happy, we're getting exactly the kind of love we need. If we're unhappy, it's always because we're somehow deficient in a particular kind of love. Just as the body needs water, air, food, different vitamins and minerals to stay healthy, the soul needs different kinds of love to grow and express itself fully through the mind, heart, and body. By learning to identify your love needs, and then opening your heart to receive the different love vitamins, you'll always be able to reconnect with your inner self. Their ten love needs are love vitamins. To achieve personal success, you need each of these love vitamins. These are the ten love vitamins. Vitamin G. Vitamin G is love and support from God. Vitamin P1. Love and support from our parents. Vitamin F. 
love and support from family, friends, and having fun. Vitamin P2, love and support from peers and others who are like us with similar goals. Vitamin S, love and support from ourselves or simply self-love. Vitamin R, love and support from intimate relationships, partnerships, and romance. Vitamin D, loving and supporting someone who's dependent on us, like a child or a pet. Vitamin C, giving back to our community. Vitamin W, giving back to the world. Vitamin G2, serving God. A rich and fully satisfying life is fueled by each of these different ten kinds of love and support. Each of these different kinds of love and support are essential if we're to be whole. Although each kind of love is just as important as another, it doesn't always seem that way. Different people have different emotional deficiencies, and based upon what's missing, they'll feel a greater need for that kind of love. Most of the time, when you're not getting what you need, it's because you're trying to get everything from one source. You're trying to stay balanced by attending to only one vitamin. The telling sign that you're looking to the wrong vitamin for help is the belief that you can't get the love you want. This happens a lot in marriage. When people get married, they often neglect their other love vitamins. They look to their partner for everything. Why? Because in the beginning, everything is wonderful. They feel as if they're in heaven. Very quickly, it begins to feel so good that they forget their other needs. This relationship heaven is temporary. While you're getting big doses of vitamin R, you're unaware of other unfulfilled needs or deficiencies. Once the need for vitamin R is fully satisfied, then you'll automatically begin to feel the emptiness of your other unfulfilled love needs. Whenever one need has been fully satisfied, then you begin to feel dissatisfied to the degree that you're deficient in your other love needs. By learning to identify your different love vitamins, you'll not be fooled by the illusion that there's not enough. By knowing where to look and how to get there, you'll understand that you can always get the love you need. The dynamics of getting what you need can best be understood by using the visual aid of love tanks. Imagine that for every love need or every love vitamin, there's a love tank. Everyone has 10 love tanks. As soon as one tank is full to stay connected, you must then begin to fill another tank. If you don't shift your focus from time to time and make sure all your love needs are being satisfied, then you'll begin to resent that your partner's not giving you enough. When we're disconnected from the true source of our fulfillment, nothing our partner does seems to be good enough. At such times, we mistakenly assume that working on the relationship will make things better. Instead, we need to focus on filling up another love tank. When a love tank is completely full, instead of what we think would happen, which is continuous fulfillment, the opposite occurs. We begin to feel bored, restless, and then dissatisfied. Although we may think we're dissatisfied with our partner, we're actually feeling the collective emptiness of our other love tanks. Ironically, the inevitable symptom of fulfillment is the awareness that we're missing something. When two people who were in love fall out of love, it's generally because they're missing vitamin S or self-love. When we're low on self-love, we begin expecting too much from our partner. Since we don't love ourselves, we need more from our partners to feel loved. Yet no matter what he or she does, it's not enough. When you're missing self-love, your partner's love can't make you feel better. Only you can do that. In a relationship, when self-love is low... We begin to resent that our partner's not treating us the way they used to. What have you done for me lately becomes our theme song. 
All the above symptoms are clear signals that we need to shift our focus from the relationship to filling up the vitamin S love tank. I first discovered the love tanks when I was writing one of my earlier books. I was making great progress. I loved everything I was writing. Then suddenly I didn't like anything. Eventually I completed the chapter and tried to be satisfied. I invited my wife Bonnie to read the chapter. When she read it, although she was polite about it, she thought it was a bit unclear and too complicated. Well, that's exactly what I felt, but I sure didn't want her to say it. I remember getting upset with her. I couldn't believe she could be so critical and so negative. That night I went out with a friend to an action movie. It had been quite a while since I'd seen a movie, and I really like action movies. After the movie, I felt great. When I came home, I was easily able to apologize to Bonnie, and I felt very loving again. The next day, I reread the chapter, easily made some changes, and then I liked it a lot. After this experience, I reviewed what happened. First, I was blocked. I didn't like the chapter I was writing, and I couldn't make any successful improvements. Then, I didn't like my wife for not liking it and got into an argument. Then, I went to a movie and felt better. That day, I realized I had different emotional needs. I needed my wife's love, I needed to love myself, and I needed to have fun with my friends. On the way to the movie, I also shared a little of my frustration with another married guy who knew exactly how I felt. This was some peer support. The result of filling up these other love tanks was that I felt better, and then I could view the situation differently and with more love. By shifting my focus to getting other needs met, I could once again come back to my true loving self. I started using this concept of different love needs with my clients and it worked. Most of the time when a couple wasn't getting along, instead of trying to get more from their partners, I pointed them in another direction to get love and support. I realized this insight and applied it to success in all areas of my life. By learning to keep the different love tanks full, I was able to sustain a powerful and positive attitude that not only made me happier, but allowed me to achieve all my business goals and beyond. There's a natural order to the love tanks. As we develop from conception to maturity, there's a specific time period for the formation of each. At each stage of development, we need one kind of love more than another to develop all our talents and abilities. As we move through a particular time period, to the extent that we're unable to get the love we need, the result will be that we can't know some aspect of ourselves. For example, when children don't get the love, understanding, and attention they need, they don't realize or learn the full truth about themselves. They don't fully understand how special they are and feel less lovable than they really are. In a variety of ways, they're held back in life until they learn to fill the empty or partially filled love tanks of the past. It's a little like trying to learn to read when no one's ever read to you first, or trying to drive a car when you've never really learned to ride a bike, or trying to run a business without basic math or reading skills. Although you can manage, there'll always be extra struggle. In a similar way, each love vitamin becomes a foundation to develop the next. This understanding of the different love tanks and the different time stages is really just common sense. People mistakenly assume that our development is over at 21, which is far from the truth. Following the same rhythm, about every seven years, we go through a major shift in maturity that corresponds to the different love tanks. If at the transitions we don't do something to heal or remedy the situation, we then continue to struggle in life by not realizing what we really need. Let's first look at what commonly happens at the 10th love tank around 56. Many men just can't wait to retire. They want to relax and have fun. They want to move forward and do the things that they put off doing to be good providers. Instead of going forward, they go back. Instead of moving into the challenges of serving God and serving the world, 
they feel the need to serve themselves. Then, as their new life eventually becomes boring, they suddenly die. The secret of getting older for a man is to continue working, but also to have lots of fun and get lots of love. Men who continue to work often do it because they love their work. When you love your work, it's a sign that you're pretty connected to your inner self. Women have less of a tendency to die around 56, but they may still regress. If they're not ready to move on, they tend to become rigid, opinionated, or negative. Rather than flow with life, she resists life with an attitude that says, I'll do what I want to do. I don't care anymore what you think. I know everything I need to know. To stay healthy, a woman needs to feel that she's not alone and that she can depend on others. The next commonly discussed crisis is the empty nest. Around the age of 49, many couples experience an emptiness in their lives. They commonly blame it on the absence of their children. For married couples, at age 49, this can be the beginning of a greater freedom to enjoy their lives together or it can be a source of problems. By this age, either we've learned how to get what we need outside the relationship or we're resenting our partner for not being enough for us. During this stage, we begin to feel our mortality and want to stay young. Quite commonly, men look to younger women to keep them feeling young while women look at their bodies trying to look younger. Again, focusing on ourselves, we miss the challenge of this age period. By this time, we should be ready to get involved in helping the world. This is a time to meet people in other communities and cultures and to expand your influence beyond your community. It's wonderful to see people in their 50s and 60s taking time to see the world. Another much discussed transition point is the midlife crisis. It generally occurs when a person's around 42. To move on to the next love tank, a person begins to feel the emptiness of their past. Before people feel they can freely give back to their community, they must be full within themselves. When it's time to move on and you're not full, instead of moving forward, you'll begin looking back to all that you didn't get. A man may suddenly want the freedom to sell his business and go mountain climbing. Or if he's married, he may feel the longing to be with other women. He'll reevaluate his life and his priorities. Quite often, he'll want to throw off the responsibilities which make him feel old. The areas in his past where he feels he sacrificed himself or he didn't get what he needed will give rise to a growing dissatisfaction. To move on in his development, his challenge is to get what he needs without creating chaos in his life are hurting the people he loves. There are ways to fill his love tanks without disrupting his life. Around 42, a woman may also become dissatisfied in her life and often complains that she hasn't gotten what she needed. She feels resentful and exhausted. If she doesn't have this understanding of love tanks, she'll tend to blame her current life instead of going back and healing her past. Certainly, these feelings could be felt at any time, but the emptiness of the past tends to come up most at these transitions. If we don't honor our past and do something to heal it by filling up the earlier love tanks, as we proceed in life, we'll not benefit from being connected to our inner source of love and fulfillment. Without that inner connection, life will never measure up to our hopes, expectations, and wishes. Around age 35, there's another crisis, but nobody talks about it. The transition at 35 is the movement towards giving love unconditionally to a dependent. Children and grandchildren are ideal dependents. They really need us, and they draw out unconditional love. But if we don't have children, a pet will definitely work just as well. Around this time, the human spirit seeks to give unconditionally to someone who needs or depends on us. The child gives the parent a great gift, the opportunity to give freely. The problem for many parents is that they've had children before they knew how to give to themselves. When a parent has children before they're ready, then around age 35, they'll begin to feel guilty for all the times they've resented being a mother or father. To avoid having this kind of resentment or to let it go, 
A parent needs to learn how to fill up their earlier love tanks. People in this stage who don't have children or don't care for something that's dependent on them, like a child, may begin to feel they're missing something. Without the motivation to give unconditionally, they'll not know why they're so dissatisfied in life. If you're without children in this time period, it's still not enough to be spending time with nieces and nephews. It takes really being responsible. Every pet owner knows that a pet is a real responsibility. They have to be fed and walked regularly. They get sick and you have to care for them. There are times of great sacrifice, just like parenting, but it's all worth it. If owning a pet doesn't fit your lifestyle, then caring for a plant or a garden can also be a way to express your nurturing instincts. Another aspect to this secret crisis is the frequency of sex in marriages. By this time, quite often the man is showing less interest and the woman is wanting more sex. This particularly happens if they got married in their 20s. After many years of wanting more sex than he got, a man just eventually turns off. As women move into this time of greater giving, they need romantic support, while their partners have in some ways given up on them and are finding their comfort playing golf. If a man hasn't got his romantic needs met, he'll often regress to earlier needs and seek to satisfy them. Rather than try to initiate sex and be rejected, he'd rather watch a ball game. If we've not taken time to find ourselves and love ourselves, before we're ready to move on to the next stage, at 28, we begin to feel that we have to go back to find ourselves. If we're married, we may seek to get out of a marriage, or if we're not married, we'll avoid getting into a relationship. There are many single women in their 30s wondering what happened. For whatever reason, they didn't find a partner. From the perspective of love tanks, the answer to this problem is that they didn't find themselves in their 20s. The 20s is a time of exploration and experimentation. If they didn't fully give themselves the opportunity to be themselves and explore their wishes and wants, then they're not satisfied with what they get later on. No partner can ever measure up if we don't love ourselves. As a result, women may resist getting involved in relationships unless the guy is, quote, marriage material, and guys will tend to back off when it's time to make a marriage commitment. When women become too picky about men, they stop appreciating what they can get and focus on what they can't get. They won't go out with just anyone. They feel that if they go out with a guy, he should have a lot of potential. They don't want to waste time and get involved with the wrong guy. In a sense, this is the right idea, but it's missing one important ingredient. She needs to be careful to not get seriously involved until it is the right guy. In the meanwhile, she needs to date a lot of guys. One method to overcome this tendency and avoid going too deep with just one man is to keep a steady stream of men in your life until the right one comes along. If in our relationships throughout our 20s or even further back, we've been hurt, then before we're ready to get involved, those hurts need to be healed. As long as we've not healed the hurt of past relationships, it's hard to move on into our 30s to find one. The secret to coping with this is to start dating, but to avoid getting too intimate until you've healed your past. As our children leave home and go to college, there's a new crisis on many campuses. It used to be that when kids left home at 21, they had to get jobs and support themselves. Today, many young adults leave home but don't have to get a job. Instead, they arrive on campus and are suddenly free to control their lives. Since they haven't learned to discipline themselves, they go wild and lose control. They begin abusing their freedom with drugs, sex, and drinking and may even drop out. Whether they continue their education or not, if people have not filled their earlier love tanks, then at this transition, they'll begin to feel insecure and either go wild or sell out seeking security. They may get married too early just to be with someone who'll take care of them, or they'll forfeit their dreams because they don't believe in themselves. To prepare for their 20s, young adults need a lot of positive peer support in their teens. 
Association with mentors and friends who have positive goals and activities is immensely helpful. Even if their interests change, they will still have experienced a sense of confidence that they can do things. At puberty, boys and girls get big doses of male and female hormones that create many new changes. Who they are as boys and girls is greatly redefined. Quite suddenly, their whole life is shaken up. In the last few years, there's been much discussion about what we can do for our daughters and sons as they make the transition through puberty. Studies show that a dramatic drop occurs in girls' self-esteem, and clearly many boys begin to display behavioral problems. As our children reach 12 to 14, they make a radical shift. Teenagers are more independent from their parents and family members and more vulnerable to peer pressure. Just because our teenagers have moved on to feeling their need for peer support, it doesn't mean they still don't need the support of family and friends. Wise parents actively support their teenagers in getting involved in positive group activities. A teenager needs to look outside his close family to find out who he is and what he can do. A teenager needs the time and opportunity to learn, find an interest, and excel. This is a period when confidence is building. Often this is a difficult period for mothers and daughters. Girls have a tendency to accommodate their mothers more at an earlier stage. When they reach their teens, to whatever extent they gave up themselves to please their mothers, they'll tend to rebel and resist maternal authority. It's hard for a daughter to pull away to find herself without pushing her mother away. Mothers generally have a harder time than fathers in letting go of the task of managing their teenagers' lives. The nurturing instincts that work so well in the earlier years can become too controlling or confining for a teenager. By learning to give up telling your kids what to do, they'll come and ask. They'll continue to stay connected with their parents if the parent is able to listen more, ask questions, but being careful not to give too much advice or tell them what to do. Leaving our parents and starting first grade can be very traumatic for a child, but often no one knows and no one remembers. Around this age, for a child to know what's going on inside, they need someone to ask them interested questions to help them look inside to talk about their experiences, feelings, emotions, and wishes. If a child didn't get enough nurturing in the first stage from birth to age 7, then in the second stage from 7 to 14, at times they'll resist having fun and continue to pull back into being a baby. They may continue to throw baby tantrums, wet their beds, suck their thumbs, or other regressive behaviors. Rather than shame a child for such behavior, a parent can recognize that this child is just trying to go back and fill their earlier love tanks. Around seven years old, an active playfulness and need for fun and friendship emerges. It's as if we wake up from the dreamy state of our first seven years. From seven to fourteen is a time to develop social skills and learn to have fun. The ability to delay gratification is learned in this playful stage. By taking turns and sharing, we grow in our ability to feel what we want and wait for it patiently. Children need pure, unconditional love, and when our early emotional needs for love are met, then we're able to stay in touch with and taste the joy of being connected to our true selves. As children, we have no ability to love ourselves. The only way we can consciously know ourselves is through the mirror of our parents' love and the way we're treated by our family and friends. When they treat us with respect, we learn that we are worthy of respect. When they treat us with caring, we see ourselves as special. Throughout elementary school or around 7 to 14, a child's greatest need is to feel safe and to play. As they continue to grow and learn about the world and how they fit in, they need to have permission to make lots of mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Our whole attitude about the world and our relationship to it begins at birth. A child is basically powerless to get what it needs when it first emerges from the womb. 
If it's not taken care of, it will die. This being the physical reality, a child forms one of two basic attitudes. I have needs and I have the power to get them met. Or, I have needs and I am powerless to get them met. This attitude of powerlessness doesn't mean that everyone grows up feeling powerless to get what he or she wants. In many cases, a deficiency can make them more powerful. When we feel that we can't get what we need, we automatically adjust in ways that may make us more powerful. We feel that no one is there for us, so if we want something, we will have to get it. Depending on others is not a clear option. When we learn too soon to do it ourselves, we think we have to do it all ourselves. We don't value the assistance of others, and we even push away valuable support. We don't feel comfortable feeling close or intimate. Our first experience in this life is that of developing in the womb. During this time, we experience our relationship with God. It's not a conceptual relationship. The brain is not yet capable of that, but there's an experience. We generally forget this experience around the age of two when our language skills are rapidly developing. And reading about these earlier stages, it's easy to become overwhelmed thinking we didn't get what we needed and start blaming our past for our problems. If you're starting to feel powerless, you're awakening the feelings you felt as a child. Now you have the opportunity to give yourself a hug and say everything's going to be fine. The basis of getting what you want and staying connected to your true self is keeping your love tanks full. If you have flowers in your garden, it's not enough to water them once. We have to attend to them all and keep nurturing them. When we're missing vitamin G1, life tends to be a struggle. We eventually become tired and stressed because we think we have to do it all ourselves. To fill this first love tank, we need to have regular contact with God or a spiritual relationship in some way with the universe. We need to understand that we're not alone and that there's a higher power always assisting us. When we're missing vitamin P1, we tend to be held back in life by feelings of doubt, inadequacy, and unworthiness. Fortunately, as adults, we don't have to depend on our parents or primary caretakers to get the unconditional love we need. As adults, we can pick and choose where to get this support, and we can learn to give it to ourselves. In a very practical sense, seeing counselors or therapists is like hiring parents. They listen to you, understand you, and give you unconditional love. As you get these needs met, you become capable of giving this support to yourself. As this tank begins to fill up, you discover either that your actual parents become more supportive of you, or that other people in your life give you this kind of unconditional love. The third love tank is love and support from family, friends, and fun. When your life is too serious and you're not having fun, you're deficient in vitamin F. If your primary relationship suffers from criticism, blame, or boredom, sometimes if you just focus on filling this tank, things will automatically get better. To keep this tank full, we need to nurture our old friendships, and sometimes we need to create new friends as well. New friends will bring out new parts of who we are. Old friends help us to love and accept ourselves the way we are. Both are needed. The fourth love tank is peer support. To fill this tank, we need to be in a club or support group of some kind. Having a favorite sports team or activity is another way of finding this support. Although in a marriage you may share many interests, it's important that you have some interests separate from your partner. If you're into sports, then one of the most powerful support groups is to attend a game of your favorite team. The stadium experience is definitely more powerful than watching a game on TV, although TV does work. Feeling your connection with your team and with other fans gives you big doses of vitamin F. To fill this tank, go places where people group together. If you like movies, don't just get the video. Go to movie theaters where people with similar interests go as well. That's the enthusiasm and focused energy with which you want to surround yourself. 
If you're open to a particular religion, then participate in group activities. Sing together and pray together. If you like a particular singing artist, then go to concerts. What a blast it is to go to a live Rolling Stones concert to bring you back to how you felt as a teenager. The music you loved as a teenager will always be a powerful anchor to bring you back to feeling the energy of your teenage self. If you have any particular challenge to overcome, attend meetings of others who've met similar challenges. Twelve-step programs for people who have given up addictions are an example of an excellent source of this vitamin. Love Tank 5 is self-love. To fill up this tank, you have to make sure that you come first. You must be in charge of your life. You must begin asking yourself what you want and then go for it. If you ask yourself what you want and the answer is you want to make others happy, you're still missing the point. What you want means what you want, not what others want. Look at what you're missing. What else do you want? What else besides making others happy makes you happy? What turns you on? Get away from people in your everyday life so that you're free to try on new outfits and behave differently. Much of the time we hold ourselves back because we're concerned with what others will think of us. We want to do things, but we don't. Because if we make mistakes, we'll be reminded of it forever. Also, being around new and different people will always bring out some new part of who you are. Whenever you share with someone new and different, a new part of you has a chance to surface. The sixth love tank is relationships, partnerships, and romance. To fill up this love tank, you need to make sure that you're sharing yourself with someone. In most cases, this need is satisfied by a loving, committed sexual relationship. To share ourselves intimately, most people need to grow together in love over time. If you're not married or in an intimate partnership, it's important to date around to fill up this tank. Dating around does not mean that you have to sleep around. Just start dating and don't look for the perfect person. When you're ready for a relationship and you're open to dating, the perfect person for you shows up. If you're desperate, the perfect person rarely shows up. Give up your neediness by having a life that supports your other needs and then you can draw in the right partner for you. Love Tank 7 is giving unconditional love to someone who's depending on you. Being responsible for the needs of others is an essential requirement of the soul. To fill this seventh love tank, we need to take care of children and then later grandkids. If we don't have our own grandchildren, then we should offer our services to others. We must feel responsible to someone else whom we care for and love. By feeling responsible and giving your love unconditionally, your soul will be strengthened. Love Tank 8 is giving back to your community, assisting in making your local world a better and more beautiful place. In this stage of life, we need to be thinking about helping others. The gifts we've received in life are the gifts we have to share with our community. To fill this tank, start looking for ways to give back some of what you've received. Love Tank 9, Giving Back to the World, is an extension of Love Tank 8. In this stage, we need to broaden our horizons and extend ourselves beyond the boundaries of our community, race, and culture. This is a time to share with those of different backgrounds and traditions. Take more vacations and broaden your experiences. If you don't expand your boundaries, you'll not grow. This is also a time when your business may thrive. When you're full within yourself and capable of giving back to the world, your own success dramatically increases. Love Tank 10 is serving God. When we come into this world, God takes care of us. At this point, we're free to serve God. This is when we can have the greatest impact in the world. Around the age of 56 is when we're fully ready to do what we're in this world to do. As you enjoy this state, 
you feel more and more that you are one with everything and everyone. You become a pure channel of God's grace to all you meet. To lead a full and rich life is not only possible, but our duty. God wants you to have it all just as much as you do. To fill our first and most important love tank, we need to feel our connection to God. There are many ways to do that. Meditation is a very powerful way. Although it's not linked to a particular religion, meditation supports all spiritual traditions. Anyone can benefit from meditation, even without believing in God. As I talk about God, you may wish to interpret that to mean positive energy, love energy, higher power, greater potential, higher wisdom, glorious future, or whatever. With any belief, meditation will help you to fill up your first love tank. Right away, you'll begin to experience greater peace and relaxation. Gradually, you'll feel joy, confidence, and love as well. By taking a few minutes every day to connect to God, you enrich your day. I lived as a monk in the mountains of Switzerland for nine years to experience my inner connection to God. Now when I teach meditation, I see people progressing light years faster than I did. Ninety percent of the people who learn to meditate at my seminars have this experience in one or two days. Everyone experiences the peace and relaxation right away. When you meditate after work, the stress of the day automatically is washed away. Feeling this current of energy recharges you and helps you to feel immediately refreshed. When you meditate at the beginning of the day, it prepares you to take on life's challenges with a positive attitude. Feeling your connection to God helps you to remember that you're not alone and that you have extra support. So much of our suffering and struggle in life occurs when we think we have to do it all ourselves. Fortunately, we don't. Help is there, but we have to ask for it. When you meditate on your connection to God, you feel more appreciative of what you have. This positive awareness, coupled with strong desire, increases your power to attract and create what you want. Naturally, when you radiate more positive energy, people want to be with you, work with you, give things to you, appreciate you, and trust you. Interactive meditation supports you in learning to draw in energy through your fingertips. If you just do your best, with higher help, your intentions come true. You're not limited by your past. Interactive meditation sets the stage to act out your life the way you want it to be. You write the script and you select the characters. To practice interactive meditation... Find a comfortable pose, sitting or lying in a place in which you'll not be interrupted. It's best to turn off the phone and give yourself 15 minutes to ignore all your responsibilities and turn inward. It's also fine to put on some soothing background music, although it's not necessary. With eyes closed, reach your hands up in the air a little above shoulder height or wherever is comfortable for you and begin repeating this phrase. O oh God, my heart is open to you. Please, come sit in my heart. Once you've said the phrase out loud ten times, then continue repeating the phrase quietly inside, silently inside, for about fifteen minutes. Have a watch or clock nearby to check the time. In the beginning, it's natural and normal for the mind to wander and have other thoughts. You may even forget the phrase. If you do, then simply open your eyes and look it up. It takes time before the process is completely automatic. To receive the blessings of God's energy, if you don't feel the tingling right away, try saying the phrase aloud a few more rounds of ten. Even in advanced states of meditation, it's normal for the mind to wander. In earlier stages, your mind will wander and think about things that may be bothering you or causing stress. In advanced stages, 
your mind wanders towards the blissful feelings and currents of increasing insight. The benefits of meditation will come even if you say the phrase only a few times before your mind starts to wander again. Keeping your hands up in the air creates a greater awareness of the fingertips. If in the beginning they get tired, it's fine to rest them on your lap, but keep your palms facing up and your fingers slightly apart. Make sure that your hands are not touching the bare skin of your legs. When your hands are directly lying on your skin, you tend to stop drawing energy in and instead feel your own energy. One of the benefits of interactive meditation is new energy to add to your own. Once you get in the habit of turning inward, you decide how much to meditate. Fifteen minutes twice a day is a good rhythm for most people. If you're really busy one day, it's fine to skip, but then try to make it up later. Your body gets used to this extra energy. When you meditate, you get extra energy and clarity, which makes you more efficient and more creative. The best times for meditation are in the morning when you get up, after work around sunset, and before you go to bed. After about 15 minutes, you'll be flowing in the consciousness of your true self as it connects to God. This is the ideal time to ask for help from God by setting your intention and putting in your order for the day. If you don't order when you go into a restaurant, you don't get food. In a similar manner, to put this energy to work, you need to feel your inner desires and intentions. At the end of meditation, when you begin the process of setting your intentions, shift your phrase to, O oh, glorious future, my heart is open to you. Please come into my life. Repeat this phrase quietly inside ten times with a little extra awareness of each finger as you did in the beginning of meditation. Feel your openness for good things to happen and then begin to reflect on how you want to feel that day. If by this time your hands are resting in your lap, raise them up again for this last part. Raising them up all the way or part way is fine. With your hands up and your eyes still closed, reflect on how you want your day to unfold. By setting your intentions, automatically things start coming to you. In the beginning, it's enough just to say, I see myself at work feeling happy. Then, at some point when you're happy at work, you notice and you acknowledge with delight, Okay, this is working. Thank you. When you deliberately set your intention, things come to pass every day and you have the wonderful opportunity to say thanks to God. As the channels in your fingers open more and you begin to draw consciously on the energy, you can learn to let go of stress most efficiently. Just as you can draw in positive energy, you can send out negative energy. This is called decharging and is just as important and easy as meditating and setting your intentions. By decharging stress, not only will you feel better, but you'll be more free to create your day. To the degree that we absorb negativity and don't have a way to release it, we'll continue to feel blocked. No matter how loving or good we are, we stay stuck in negative feelings. These are four common symptoms of those who absorb negativity and don't know how to release it. Blocked love. When we absorb negativity, we may want to be more loving, but we feel recurring waves of blame and resentment. Our love is restricted or restrained. We want to love, but we can't. Blocked confidence. When we absorb negativity, we may try to be confident and have faith, but we still feel rushes of anxiety and confusion when we take risks. Our confidence is blocked. We feel our soul's desire to be more and do more, but we feel held back. Blocked joy. When we absorb negativity, we may try to be happy, but we feel pulled down by depression and self-pity. Our joy is diluted and flat. We feel our soul longing to be happy, but something's missing. Blocked peace. 
When we absorb negativity, we may try to feel good about ourselves, but we still feel the occasional grip of guilt and unworthiness. We're unable to feel the purity of our innate goodness and innocence and the peace of mind that it affords. We feel tainted or stained by our past mistakes and are unable to forgive ourselves. Sensitive souls draw in the negativity of others because they're so open. The negativity they feel is a mixture of their own with others. Like a sponge, they draw in negativity wherever they go. If they're much more sensitive than other family members, they'll absorb the negativity of the whole family. What the parents suppress, the sensitive child will feel and express. A child only becomes the black sheep of the family when absorbing the negativity that everyone else is suppressing. When people suppress their negativity, they not only send it out to others who are more sensitive, but they absorb less negativity from the world. It's as if they have a one-way valve connecting their tank to the feelings of others. They send out negativity, but they don't draw it in. In a similar way, some very loving and positive people get sick because they absorb negativity, but don't know how to send it out. If you're sensitive, unless you find a way to decharge the negativity you absorb, you'll continue to suffer unnecessarily. When people are stuck in any of the twelve blocks to personal success, they're often chronically disconnected from the positive energy of who they truly are and send out negative energy instead. Some people exude negative energy because of their lifestyle, friends, and thinking habits. They could be sending it out all the time or just part of the time. To the degree that you're sensitive and porous, being around these people will actually make you sick. Other people who are much more in touch with their true nature automatically send out positive energy. They could be sending it out all the time or just sometimes when they're doing something that they're really good at or they love to do. To be around these people will actually make you feel better. This is why we're drawn to successful people. The solution to absorbing negative energy is not becoming less sensitive. That would only lessen the ability to draw in and recharge with more energy. By learning to decharge, you can freely share your energy with the world. The first step in learning to decharge is interactive meditation. Just as you have the ability to draw in energy through your fingertips in meditation, you then have the ability to send it out. Once you've learned to meditate, it's incredibly easy to decharge. After meditating for 10 or 15 minutes with your hands up, Open your eyes, lower your hands, and point them in the direction of a live plant, fire, or a body of water. Continue to repeat the meditation phrase over and over with a simple intention to send your negativity out and into whatever you're pointing at. After some practice, you don't even have to meditate first. You can just begin the decharging process and do it with eyes open or closed. These are some basic decharging phrases. Oh God, my heart is open to you. Please come sit in my heart. Take this stress. Take this stress. Or, Oh God, my heart is open to you. Please come sit in my heart. Take this negativity. Take this negativity. Decharging is an incredible experience. You'll feel a flow of energy flowing right out of your fingers. As it leaves, the energy doesn't in any way feel negative. It just feels good to be moving the energy. When people first hear about decharging into an object of nature, they sometimes think it doesn't seem right to direct negative energy to nature. But it's not hurtful at all. Nature absorbs and recycles the energy you decharge. Plants, flowers, bushes, and trees are usually the best objects in which to decharge. For most people, flowers are the most powerful. 
Now we can begin to understand why there are flowers in every performer's dressing room, why a man brings flowers when he wants to make up. Women may not know why receiving flowers works, but it does. Now you know. When a man brings flowers to his partner, those flowers automatically help her to decharge and let go of her negative feelings. Just as we reach up to heaven to receive our blessing, we need to reach down to Mother Earth to take out our negativity. Another place to decharge is into a sink filled with water, a bathtub, hot tub, pool, pond, river, lake, or ocean. The bigger the body of water, the more powerful the decharge. Water will absorb negativity. Fire is another powerful aspect of nature which we can use to decharge. Think back to the wonderful times you may have spent telling scary stories around a campfire. The stories would bring up the fear, and then the fire would absorb the negative energy right out of us. Walking barefoot on the earth, the grass, or the beach is also a powerful way to decharge. As you walk, continue to say your meditation phrase and direct your fingers down to the earth. This can also be done while walking in a forest. It's fun to aim your fingers towards the trees and send out your negative energy like little ray guns and receive nature's blessing. Working in the garden and putting your fingers in the dirt is also a great activity that allows you to decharge automatically. I suggest learning with your eyes open and hands pointing down because many people experience the flow of energy better that way. The most efficient and powerful way to decharge is to do it with your eyes closed and holding a fresh leaf or flower. You can decharge any time you feel negative energy. It will always help you to feel better. As a practice, it's good to do it at least a few times a week for five or ten minutes. In the beginning, you may wish to do it much longer. For sensitive people, a whole lifetime of negativity begins to drain out. The best rule of thumb is to decharge as much as is enjoyable. You can't overdo it. If you work in a stressful or negative environment, it's a good idea to decharge every day. A few minutes of decharging can be done while you're in the shower. Even though decharging can create unbelievable benefits right away, learning to meditate is the first step. As you develop your ability to draw in positive energy and decharge negative energy, confronting the challenges of negativity will make you stronger. The number one obstacle to receiving love in each of the love tanks is the inability to feel and to release negative emotions. There's a big difference between letting go of negative emotions and not feeling them. To let go of them, we have to feel them. When we're not regularly feeling negative emotions and letting them go, our love tanks can't fill up. When emotions are blocked or not felt, either we can't get the energy and love we need or we're unable to get the power to attract and manifest what we want. Some people block their potential by suppressing, numbing, or repressing emotions. Others feel their emotions but are unable to release them or let go. They become stuck feeling negative emotions and attract situations in their lives to mirror their negativity. Processing your feelings means identifying your negative emotions and releasing them by getting in touch with your underlying desires and positive feelings. Processing negative emotions is using them to come back to the true self. As you begin to process your negative emotions, for some it's difficult to identify them, while for others it's difficult to release them. When you learn to use the four ways to process feelings, these challenges become easier. One method is not better than another. To use these different methods, just move through them until one of them works. The methods for processing emotion are as follows. 1. Change the emotion. 2. Change the content. 3. Change the clock, backward or forward. 4. Change the subject altogether. Shift from feeling your pain to feeling the pain of another.
The first way to process is to feel whatever negative feeling you can and then change the emotion. If you're angry about something, write out those feelings for a few minutes. Then change your feeling to another negative emotion. This is similar to riding a bike and finding balance by moving in the opposite direction, which will then put you off balance in the other direction. Moving back and forth between negative emotions releases any blocks and greatly assists you in finding balance. Most of the time when people are stuck in any particular emotion, it's because they're blocking another emotion. Any negative emotion that's not being felt will block the flow of energy and keep you from letting go. The second way to process feelings is to change the content. When you experience a feeling, but it doesn't fully seem to relate to what you're upset about, simply change the content. If you're angry with your boss and don't seem to be able to let go, make a list of all the possible things you could be angry about. Feel your anger and ask yourself, what else are you angry about? Whenever you stay upset about something that can't be changed, it's generally a clue that you're really more upset about something else. The third way to process feelings is to change the clock. If you're upset by something and can't seem to feel and release your feelings by using step one or two, then recall a time in your past when you may have experienced similar feelings. For example, if you felt abandoned as a young child, those feelings can still be affecting you. As soon as someone rejects you a little, it can seem much more painful because of your past. When this is the case, the best way to process is to link what you feel now to something you felt then. The past is always easier to process. If we're afraid now, we don't know what the outcome will be. When we look back to the past, we can always reassure ourselves that things have and will work out. Even if we couldn't get the support we needed in the past, we can imagine and picture ourselves getting that support. In this way, we can heal the wounds of the past. The fourth means of processing is to shift the subject away from your pain to someone else's. To get perspective, we need to find someone outside ourselves and experience that person's pain. This is probably the easiest of all methods the oldest form of therapy known to mankind. It can be found in literature, comedy, theater, singing, movies, CDs, and TV. Telling stories and sharing with friends or sharing in a support group of like-minded people are important ways to step out of our pain but not away from it. As we hear the pain of others and cry with them, laugh with them, and feel with them, our own feelings are being felt and released. For people who can't find their pain to process, the fourth way is often the most direct in assisting them to begin to look inside to feel and heal. When upset, many people try to change their negative emotion right back into a positive emotion. This is one of the major reasons people get stuck. They try to release their negative emotions too quickly. When you're stuck in a negative emotion, and you don't have a lot of practice finding balance, it's very difficult to find another emotion that you feel. The 12 negative emotional states we naturally feel to find balance are as follows. I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. I'm worried. I'm embarrassed. I'm jealous, I'm hurt, I'm scared, I'm ashamed. When you feel stuck in anger, take some time to feel and express what you're angry about and then ask yourself what you feel sad about. Anger is generally a reaction to what happened. Sadness is a reaction to what didn't happen. Right away, you'll begin to experience a release of your angry feelings. As you shift to another feeling, you'll begin to go deeper. The negative emotions will always bring you back to balance. As you move back to center, you'll start to feel better. If you're stuck feeling sad, then shift to feeling afraid. Whenever we're focusing on what didn't happen, it's generally because at a deeper level, we're afraid about something that might happen. 
Fear is generally our reaction to what could happen that we don't want to happen. As you practice this release technique, you'll discover that much of the time what you think you're upset about is just the tip of the iceberg. By getting inside yourself and exploring other things that may be bothering you, you'll find that you can give up resisting what you can't change and that what you're really upset about can be changed either by a little shift in your attitude or by a change in your behavior. With an awareness of each of these four methods, you now have powerful tools to process your feelings. You have the power to get in touch with and release any negative emotions. To achieve personal success, it's not enough to be happy. You must also grow in your desire for more. To have outer success, we must want it so much that it hurts when we don't get it. At the same time, we must learn how to release and heal that hurt so that we can experience inner happiness as well. The secret of all outer success is desire. You must know what you want, feel it deeply, and believe. Passion, belief, and desire are power. When you continue to feel and act on what you want, the universe responds to your will. By taking action to get what you want, you strengthen your belief. The world will not believe in you until you believe first. When you take the risk, when you make the commitment and follow through, when you make the jump into the abyss of the unknown, you're reinforcing your belief in yourself and the possibility of getting what you want. Pushing yourself to extremes is not necessary when you know how to tap into intuition. Once you've learned to access your inner intuition and confidence, then you don't have to push so hard or take big risks to attract success. Whenever we push ourselves to our limit, we feel our limit by experiencing negative emotions. The limit means we can't feel positive about this anymore. When we push to our limit and then let go, we are turning it over to God, Spirit, or that mysterious source of brilliant ideas. Regardless of your particular orientation, when you let go after doing everything you can, you'll receive what you want. Turning it over to God means remembering that you don't have to do it all, just as you don't have to get out and push your car. All you have to do is know how to drive. We still have to do our best, but it's much easier when we know and trust that extra power is already there. There are some who do turn it over to God, but don't get what they want in the outer world. They put it all in God's hands. This doesn't work either. To have success, we need to do both. God helps those who help themselves and then ask for help. You have to do it, and then God sends His angels or divine energy to help. To achieve personal success, we need both inner spirituality and outer success. We need to make sure that our positive thinking doesn't prevent us from feeling our negative emotions and having strong desires. In this sense, we not only need to practice positive thinking, but also we need to have a more positive attitude about negative emotions and desires. I remember when my daughter Lauren first learned about the magic of asking for what you want and having faith. When she was about five years old, we were on vacation in Hawaii. In a little bookstore, she found a box of magic stars. She picked one up and asked me what it was. I took one and read the instructions, which said something like this. Hold this magic star close to your heart. Close your eyes and then make a wish. You can have anything that you want. When she heard this, she lit up with such excitement. It was as if she'd made the discovery of a lifetime. She said, Can I ask for anything? I said, Yes. She then asked if I'd get her one. As we were walking along the beach, she was beaming with a huge smile. She was holding her magic star next to her heart and making wishes. Then after a few hours, she asked, Daddy, how come my wishes aren't coming true? I thought, oh God, how can I answer this? Well, I didn't have to. My wife Bonnie responded by saying, 
as long as you keep your heart open and continue to make your wishes, then they will come true. But they don't always come true right away. It takes time, and you have to have patience. Lauren was satisfied with this answer, and she continued to beam. And that one statement, Bonnie had summarized the secrets of outer success, which is probably why she has so much of it in her life. Keep your heart open and continue to want what you want. This secret explains why so many people lose their creative power. When they don't get what they want, they give up and stop believing. The secret of creating is sustaining a strong, willful intention. It feels like this. I will have that. I really want it, and I trust it will come. By getting in touch and staying in touch with your deepest desires, you can find your own magic star. By continuing to focus and feel what you really want, you'll increase your power to create your life. First in your mind and heart, and then through your actions, you'll be increasingly successful in creating what you really want. Knowing what you really want is not as easy as it sounds. There are many ways we get distracted from our true desires. Sometimes it's just too painful to feel what we really want, and we believe that we'll never have it. Fear is one of the major reasons we don't give ourselves permission to feel what we want. If we want something that's not as important to us and we don't get it, it's not so painful. If we let ourselves really feel what's most important to us, it may be too painful to fail. Whenever you risk doing something which is closer to who you are, the thought of rejection or failure is greater. When you're true to who you are, you're exposed. If you're rejected or criticized, then it cuts much closer and it hurts more. To uncover our power to create what we want and experience greater confidence, we need to become very conscious of the ways we may be pushing down or denying our true desires. When we have a desire that's not fulfilled, quite commonly we give it up in some way. We stop caring as much. We stop wanting. We stop trusting. When a man stops believing, he'll stop caring. When a woman stops believing, she'll stop trusting. In both cases, they'll give up hope. Hope is vitally important to stay in touch with our ability to feel our desires fully. The secret to increasing your power to get what you want is to feel your negative emotions when you don't get what you want and then release them. As you learn to release negative feelings and emotions, you're left feeling your true desires. When we don't know how to release our negative emotions, the easiest way to leave them behind is to stop wanting. The process of denial is simple to understand. If not getting something that I want bothers me, I simply stop wanting it or lessen my desire. If I adjust my desire always to accept what I get, I can be free of negative emotions. Some people are very happy doing this but then wonder why they may be bored or why they're not getting more of what they want. Denial is perfectly described in the fable of the fox and the grapes. The fox really wanted to taste the grapes, but when he realized that he couldn't have the grapes, his reaction was to deny his desire. After discovering that he couldn't get what he wanted, he said to himself, well, I didn't want those grapes anyway. In this way, we deny our deepest dreams when we don't realize our inner power to make our dreams come true. We all have a magic wishing star. We just have to keep feeling our wants and wishes as we increase our confidence in the art of getting what we want. To take the struggle out of your life when you want more, just ask God. People who believe in themselves alone do have the power, but they also experience enormous pressure to sustain it. If you ask for help each day, the wear and tear of life diminishes. As we begin learning to fill our love tanks by getting the love we need, our true desires begin to come into focus. Why is it that when we don't want something, it tends to follow us through life? Quite often, what we resist persists. Yet unless we resist negativity, how can we change it? This one belief 
is what holds us back much of the time from getting what we want. We think that by resisting what we don't want, it will go away. Well, it won't. In many cases, it's only by giving up our resistance that we're free to create what we want. When we resist what we don't want, it's like putting gasoline in a fire. We just add power to someone or a situation when we actively resist it. When we resist what we don't want, we're giving it our full attention and we're acting from the belief that we can't get what we want because of the situation or circumstance outside of ourselves. Through resistance, we deny our inner power to create and attract what we want. Actively focusing on what we don't want weakens our power to get what we do want. It's difficult to feel confident that we can make our dreams come true when we're focusing on what we're not getting. It's difficult to experience our state of inner happiness, love, and peace when we're focusing outward to find it. Our power to create our future is all in our attitude and approach. Instead of directly resisting, feel and release your negative emotions and then focus on what you want. When you believe, challenges make you stronger and increase your belief. When hopelessness begins to win out over our inner confidence, we begin to resist the world unnecessarily. Instead of being open to what we have and working with it to get what we want, we use up all our power resisting what we have. When we resist a person or situation, we misdirect our desire. Instead of wanting to complete a project, we waste tremendous energy not wanting to do the project. Instead of wanting to make up in a relationship, we waste energy wishing our partner would stop a particular behavior. We focus on what we don't want and bring our thoughts to all the times we didn't get what we wanted. Instead, we need to focus more on what we do want and remember all the times we got it. Imagine that your partner was sick but you knew for sure she'd get well soon. In this case, you don't mind picking up the slack and taking care of your partner. You don't take it personally that you're being ignored. You don't resist the sickness, nor do you feel burdened. Your resistance goes away because you're assured of getting what you need and want later on. Your confident belief in what is to come frees you from getting caught in the bind of resistance. With this insight about resistance, it becomes clear that to achieve success, we need to give up resistance. Achieving outer success is like a snowball rolling down a hill. As it rolls, it gets bigger and bigger. Likewise, as you experience some success, you believe more and you get more. As you get more, you believe more and your success grows. Your confidence then increases and you become more excited and enthusiastic. You begin to glow with positive energy and belief. Once people get on a roll, they often keep going for a while. Nothing builds success like success. By understanding this, you can appreciate why it's so important to set your intentions each day. When you put in your request and things happen, you get excited as you comprehend your inner power to attract results in your life. If, however, you're not open to appreciating the little miracles, you'll never draw in the really big ones. Instead, you'll get caught up resisting the things you don't want to happen. To experience personal success, we must feel and act on our true desires. Yet, most of our desires throughout the day come from resistance or not wanting. These are not our true desires. In a sense, they're false desires. Instead of attracting what you really want, a false desire wastes energy and reinforces the belief that we're powerless to get what we really want. When we've been hurt in a business deal or a relationship, we approach life from the perspective that we don't want to be hurt again. Our resistance to being hurt actually attracts opportunities to be hurt again. On the other hand, when we've not been hurt, we don't think much about it. Instead, we naturally focus on what we do want, and that is then what we attract in our life. Unless we can let go of the pain 
associated with a past event, we tend to get stuck in a negative pattern of repeating certain aspects of it. For example, if we passionately don't want to be alone, that is what we get. If we really don't want to be rejected or ignored, that is what we get. If we hate the possibility of failing or losing at something, that is what we get. If we dread going to an unhappy job, then it continues to be a source of pain. As an experiment, notice all the negative thoughts and beliefs that you actually put into words in a day. And how we express our resistance is only the tip of the iceberg. Our negative comments reflect a world of resistance within, although our real challenge is to heal those inner feelings and beliefs. Start by being aware of what you say and being careful with your words. These same principles hold true in relationships. Instead of focusing on what you don't want your partner to do or how you don't want your partner to feel, begin putting your attention on the behaviors and responses that you do want. Remember a time when your partner was appreciative of you. Feel it inside. I want my partner to love me and think I'm wonderful. Instead of thinking, my partner never helps me anymore, remember times when your partner helped out. Remember how that made you feel. Then set your intention to feeling that way and then think, I want my partner to offer to help out. In this way, by shifting your attitude, 90% of the problem is solved. The secret to asking for more is to do it without conveying a message of blame, shame, or guilt. This same approach applies to every relationship in the office, at school, or at home. To keep attracting more in our lives, we must continue to experience new levels of self-love and confidence. There's no end to the process of creating more and more. Recognizing and honoring all your desires is the basis of finding your true self. When you're not experiencing inner success, you're not in touch with your soul's desire. When you're not experiencing outer success, you're not connecting with your mind's desire. When you're not attracting what you need, you're not fulfilling your heart's desire. When you're not healthy or vibrant in your body, you're not fulfilling your body's desires. When you listen to and honor all desires, they begin to become more harmonious. When a desire felt at any one level is in harmony with the other levels, then it's a true desire. There are generally 12 ways we disconnect from feeling our true wants. They are revenge, attachment, doubt, rationalization, defiance, submission, avoidance, justification, rejection, withholding, reaction, and sacrifice. Let's explore each in greater detail. If you're angry and you don't know how to let go of your anger, one of the ways you tend to push your anger away is by getting even. Your time, energy, and attention is limited. If what you really want in life is to be loving and happy, it's a complete waste of time and energy to get even. Revenge provides relief, but it doesn't heal anything. By learning to release blame with forgiveness, you'll be free of this tendency to waste your energy and power trying to get even. As long as you're holding on to the desire to punish, get even, or teach someone a lesson, you'll just be giving them space in your brain free of charge. Quite often, when we lose someone or something, we feel a range of such negative emotions as sadness, fear, sorrow, and frustration. Feeling these emotions is healing and a necessary part of letting go. If you don't know how to process and let go of negative feelings by healing the heart, you'll continue to want what you can't have anymore. When we cling to our past, we unknowingly push away our glorious future. Ultimately, there's nothing wrong with attachment. When we love someone, we want to hold on. When it's time to change, we must be able to let go. To let go of the attachment, we need to find love in our hearts again. We mistakenly believe 
we need someone specific or some particular thing, when really what we need is what that person or thing provided us. No one could ever replace that person, but there are always other ways to fill up our love tanks. To access your creative power to solve problems and create what you want, you have to start from uncertainty. There's a big difference between doubt, which is not believing, and simply not knowing. From a place of not knowing, you can still believe that something is possible. When afraid, you can say, I really don't know. Maybe it could happen, or maybe not. When there's a question, the answer will come. Most anxiety is believing our fear instead of remembering that we really don't know. By opening your mind to all possibilities, you can begin to tap into your inner guidance and to feel trust again. Another way we block feeling our true desires is by rationalizing them away. As soon as we rationalize or try to talk away our negativity, we'll cause suppression and disconnection from our true nature. Rationalization may work temporarily to create relief, but in a variety of ways, it's counterproductive. Besides disconnecting us from our true self, it drains us of life force and results in sickness, boredom, and lifelessness. Even more important, rationalizing can cover up our natural feelings of remorse that allow us to self-correct. We say to ourselves, there was no other way to get what I needed, or I shouldn't feel bad, I wasn't responsible. With this kind of denial, we disconnect from our compassionate selves. These kind of cold rationalizations harden the heart and prevent us from connecting to the world. If we're annoyed by someone and that person doesn't want us to do something, we'll do it just to defy them. We may get great satisfaction from doing the opposite of what that person wants, but we will have leaked out our power. We think that we're sure showing them, but all we're really showing is that that person is still controlling us. I remember one man who hated his father. His father said he would never amount to anything, and so the son set out to defy him and prove him wrong. He succeeded in becoming a millionaire because he had strong passion and desire. His passionate defiance gave him the power to create and attract success. But unfortunately, his heart was closed, so he couldn't enjoy his money. Sometimes we want to do things just to defy someone or prove them wrong. What a waste of time and energy to allow someone we don't even love to affect our behavior that much. When we're disappointed, instead of surrendering to accept what has happened, we sometimes give in and submit. We stop believing in ourselves and God and give up our desire. There's a subtle distinction between surrender and submission. When we surrender, we're just making an adjustment in our expectations of how soon we'll get what we want. Surrender nurtures patience, but doesn't preclude persistence and strength. Another prayer that aptly describes the difference between surrender and submission is the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Much of the time, when we think or feel we really want to do something, we're actually seeking to avoid doing what we really want to do. Often we're afraid of failure, and so we put things off. Unless we have the clarity about what we really want, we can't harness our inner powers. We could spend much of our lives going in the wrong direction when we just need to make a few adjustments and take a few steps in the right direction, and everything will start to work out. The right direction is the direction that you're truly wanting to go towards. Quite often, when we're looking for a partner, we're really seeking to avoid our feelings of loneliness. When we're hungry for success, we're sometimes running away from the feelings of failure and inadequacy that still need to be healed. By dwelling on a replacement desire, you weaken your true desires, which have much greater power. Some people lose touch with what they truly want by over-defending or justifying their position. 
rather than make up after an argument by looking at how they contributed to the problem, they refuse to acknowledge their contribution until the other person apologizes first. If we don't acknowledge our mistakes, we can't fully connect to our inner feelings of regret, sorrow, and remorse. Without these feelings, it's almost impossible to self-correct our attitudes and behaviors. We lose touch with our natural desire to learn and grow. By becoming aware of your tendencies to defend and how they hurt you, you can appropriately defend yourself from your defenses. When we acknowledge that we made a mistake, not if I made a mistake, our heart's desire is always to find an appropriate way to make it up. We want to comfort the person or compensate in some way. Wanting to make it up is an important link to our inner feelings of conscience which motivate us to do what is good and wholesome. When children are deprived of touch, often the result is that later in life they don't feel comfortable being touched. If we're deprived of an important need while growing up, rather than feel the enormous pain of deprivation, we just stop feeling our need. Then later in life, if someone tries to give us what we need, we'll reject it. To break this tendency to reject what we really want and need, we must ask someone we trust to give us what we know we need but feel uncomfortable receiving. When you're able to experience and release the negative feelings linked to your rejection, you'll begin to appreciate receiving what you need. That appreciation then becomes a magnet to attract more. One of the biggest blocks to getting in touch with your true desire to love and be loved is withholding love. When people hurt us, often our reaction is to withhold our love. Our motivation is either to punish or to protect ourselves from being hurt again. Either way, we are the ones who suffer. If loving means you have to sacrifice yourself for others or allow others to hurt you again, then withholding would seem to be a good idea, but it's not. When the tendency to withhold exists, we need to be aware of it and then begin to let go of it. Sometimes the best way to release this tendency is to vent it. To vent, write out all your feelings about the person or situation. After each sentence, write, I do not want to love you again. Each time you do this, begin to recognize that the only person you're hurting is you. Sometimes we're willing to do something for someone but the way that person asks for what they want or demands more is such a turnoff that we react and change our minds. If we're really willing to accommodate and help someone, we can't let that person's manners keep us from being true to ourselves. To keep your power, don't let others or their lack of manners or lack of respect bring you down to their level. You sustain your grace, power, and position by not matching their energy and sending it back. When someone gets angry with us, we automatically become angry back. This is a reaction. When you send anger back out, others react to you with anger and negativity again. In this way, it goes on and on. If you want your life to be different, you have to stop the endless cycle of reactions. If someone hurts you, you react and want to hurt back. This makes that person and others want to hurt you, which makes you more reactive. Most of the time, when we're experiencing negative emotions, it's best to keep them to ourselves, be aware of them, learn from them, and then release them by coming back to a positive desire and then act to communicate that desire. When we love someone a lot, we're happy to make occasional sacrifices for that person. It feels good to show our love that way. Making sacrifices, however, is only an act of love when our love tanks are full. Since sacrifice is associated with loving, many loving people will keep sacrificing their own wants until they're completely empty and even sick. They're so used to making others happy and giving to others that they don't even know what they want. One of the ways to start getting in touch with what you want when you're an overgiver, is to pretend that you're selfish and give yourself permission to be temporarily angry and demanding. Make a list of the things that you're angry about. 
Getting in touch with anger, frustration, and jealousy will lead you right back to a greater awareness of what you want. By learning to recognize the different ways you disconnect from your true desires, you can then make the necessary small adjustments to begin feeling what you want. By fully feeling your positive desires, you'll begin to attract and create everything you want. When we're experiencing one of the 12 blocks to personal success, no matter how much we feel them, they don't go away. Feeling our blocks only makes them stronger. The 12 blocks are blame, depression, anxiety, indifference, judgment, indecision, procrastination, perfectionism, resentment, self-pity, confusion, and guilt. To remove a block, we must do more than just feel it. For example, sitting around and feeling blame will just make you feel more like a victim, powerless to get what you need. Our sinking into depression just reaffirms that you have no good reason to be happy. Dwelling on and feeling negativity only works when we're feeling our negative emotions. Pure negative emotions help us to find our way back to balance when we're moving away from the true self. Blocks are different from negative emotions. Knowing this distinction makes a world of difference. Let's explore each of the 12 blocks and insights for releasing them. When you blame others for your lack of happiness, you give up your ability to heal yourself from sickness and unhappiness. Blame prevents you from taking responsibility for your life and affirms that you're powerless. If you stole money from me and it hurt my business, blame is helpful to recognize what happened to put me in my situation so that now I can correct it and avoid it happening again. However, if I continue to blame you for my lack of success, I'm holding on to the belief that I cannot create what I want because of you. This limited belief prevents me from being able to create my future. Forgiveness is letting go of the tendency to hold others responsible for our plight in this world. Forgiveness allows you to come back to your loving nature, but alerts you to choose how you want to relate with this person in the future. The negative belief associated with blame is, because of what happened, I can't get what I need or want. Realizing this is not true, we're free to let go of blame and forgive the mistakes of others and ourselves. You become depressed when you've disconnected from your innate ability to recognize, appreciate, and enjoy the many blessings of your life. The major cause of depression in women is feeling isolated. When a woman feels that she can't get what she needs, she becomes increasingly depressed. One of the major symptoms of depression is a feeling of emptiness and powerlessness. The major cause of depression in men is feeling unneeded. When a man is out of work or he doesn't feel appreciated in the office or in a relationship, he'll become depressed. He'll experience an immediate drop in his energy level and he'll start to feel his life is flat. One of the key symptoms of depression is a lack of motivation and a general feeling that nothing will make a difference no matter what they do. If you're depressed because you feel alone in a relationship, then look elsewhere for love. Don't get stuck in the limited belief that there's only one person who can make you happy. This doesn't mean you have to leave your partner. It means you have to look to another love tank for support. If you're depressed in business because what you thought was going to happen didn't, realize that there are many other ways to achieve your goal eventually. We often become depressed when we think that there's only one way to get what we need or achieve what we want. Carol, age 26, came for counseling because she was depressed. Using the techniques we'll explore later in this program, we made great progress and she was feeling much better. At the new year, she returned to counseling and was depressed again. I asked what had happened during the holidays. She said, I was so hurt. My own mother didn't invite me to share Christmas morning with the family. She invited my sister, but she didn't invite me. I asked her what she did on Christmas morning. 
She said her Aunt Ruth had called her and invited her over to celebrate. She went on to describe how wonderful it was, but then shifted to feeling even more hurt that her own mother would not give her what her aunt had. After listening for a while, I then pointed out to her how she had made great progress. Although her mother had rejected her, she had healed her heart to receive the same kind of love from another source, her aunt. That moment of recognition was a big shift for Carol. She realized that it was true. She had spent her life trying to get her mother to love her, and her mother just wasn't able to. By letting go of her blame and her need for her mother's love, Carol had attracted a perfect mother surrogate, who not only loved Carol, but understood very intimately the challenges she faced growing up with her mother. Carol realized that she was getting what she needed, but in a different form. She was able to let go of her depression once again. When Carol faced her challenges in life, her reaction was often to be depressed. By remembering this direct experience of her power to get what she needed, she was then able to face challenges with a greater strength without becoming depressed. For her, personal success was an experienced reality. She could now recognize that when she was starting to move towards depression, she was not looking in the right direction for what she needed. You experience anxiety when you've disconnected with your innate ability to trust that everything will work out and always does. In most cases, we block the creative energy that's wanting to flow through us when we're anxious. With anxiety, either you forfeit your ability to enjoy your life or you choose to avoid the discomfort of nervousness and live in your comfort zone. However, if you don't take risks, you can't grow and your life becomes flat. On the other hand, if you take risks because of the anxiety, you suffer. There is another option. Take risks, let the feelings of nervousness come up, and then process your negative emotions. When you become indifferent, you're no longer able to feel your soul's desire. You stop trusting that you can really get what you want, or you stop caring about what you really want. Indifference is an automatic response to feeling powerless to get what we need. We assume that what we want is just not possible. Quite often, a man's first reaction will be just to shut down. And The basic technique for removing blocks is to feel the underlying emotions associated with the block. Imagine an iceberg. Only 10% is above the water and the rest is below. By simply feeling the block, you stay on the surface. By looking for the feelings, emotions, and wants under the surface, you'll remove the block. When you're blocked, you're upset about many things at once, and most of your feelings are hidden. Let's say I bump a particular man by mistake, and he becomes very angry with me. He may think he's just angry with me, but he's also angry about other things. If at that time everything was great in his life, he'd not have felt so angry. Let's look at the other feelings he may be having just under the surface of his conscious awareness. He's angry about my mistake, but he's also angry that he lost his job. Under his anger is sadness that he doesn't have steady income. Under his sadness is fear. He's afraid that he'll not get a job or ever solve his problems. He's afraid that his wife will not love him. Under his fear is sorrow. He's sorry that he can't find his way to success. On the surface, he may be blaming me for bumping him, but underneath the tip of the iceberg are many feelings. If we create a big reason to be upset, we too will easily be able to understand the deeper levels of our own feelings and be understanding and compassionate. Although this is a simple idea, it's the fundamental method of letting go of blocks. To process a block, turn back the clock. Imagine yourself at a time in your past when you were more vulnerable and thus able to feel more intensely. It's always easier to process feelings in the past. Even if you now feel fine about your past, go back and experience what you felt before you felt fine. Whenever you're blocked, you're not fully feeling your emotions. 
This means that you're not connected to the emotional part of you. To find that part, you must become like a child again. By imagining yourself to be like a child, you can easily create a big reason to feel upset. If you can't recall an incident, then you have to invent a story and pretend that it happened. Most people can remember at least a few painful or difficult moments from childhood. All it takes is one event to be able to connect with the painful feelings you felt as a child. It's easy to process your past. With a little practice, you have discovered your inner power to remove all the blocks. These are the four basic steps. 1. Identify your block and link it to the past. 2. Write a feeling letter. 3. Write a response letter. 4. Write a connection letter. When you learn to process your past and let go of your blocks, your history will lose its power to hold you back and instead give you important support to create the future you wish. The feeling letter format is a little different for each of the 12 blocks. The 12 feeling letter formats are Number 1. For blame. Recall a time when you felt betrayed and then explore anger, sadness, fear, and sorrow. Number two, for depression, recall a time when you felt abandoned and then explore sadness, fear, sorrow, and frustration. Number three, for anxiety, recall a time when you felt uncertain and then explore fear, sorrow, frustration, and disappointment. Number four, for indifference, Recall a time when you felt powerless and then explore sorrow, frustration, disappointment, and worry. Number five, for judgment. Recall a time when you felt dissatisfied and then explore frustration, disappointment, worry, and embarrassment. Number six, for indecision. Recall a time you felt discouraged and then explore disappointment, worry, embarrassment, and jealousy. Number seven, for procrastination. Recall a time when you felt helpless, and then explore worry, embarrassment, jealousy, and hurt. For perfectionism, recall a time when you felt inadequate, and then explore embarrassment, jealousy, hurt and panic. Number nine, for resentment. Recall a time when you felt deprived and then explore jealousy, hurt, panic, and shame. Number ten, for self-pity. Recall a time when you felt excluded and then explore hurt, panic, shame, and anger. Number 11. For confusion, recall a time when you felt hopeless and then explore panic, shame, anger, and sadness. Number 12. For guilt, recall a time when you felt unworthy and then explore shame, anger, sadness, and fear. Once you've selected the four appropriate emotions, Decide to whom you want to address your letter. Generally, when you address a feeling letter to your parents, you're able to release the deepest feelings. Even if you didn't know a parent, you have a relationship with your mother or father in your mind and heart. You may also choose to write a feeling letter to anyone who's bothered you or to anyone to whom you feel a connection and whose support you'd like. Once you've determined to whom you're going to write the letter, It opens like this. Dear so-and-so, I feel betrayed when, and then you complete the sentence. I'm angry that, and then you complete the sentence. I'm sad that, and then you complete the sentence. I'm afraid that, and you complete the sentence. I'm sorry that, and you complete the sentence. I want, and then complete that sentence by expressing your different wants. 
After selecting the appropriate feeling and emotions for a block, use the lead-in phrases to assist you in expressing them. At the end of your letters, always express what you want. This feeling letter is for your own healing. It's not necessary to send it to someone. After writing out your feelings and wants, imagine getting the ideal response. If you were disappointed or betrayed in any way, have that person make promises to make you feel better. Maybe you primarily need encouragement or reassurance that you're loved and special. Write out whatever you need to hear. As you write out the response you want to hear, imagine how it would make you feel and let those feelings come up. Even if the person in real life would not say these positive words and follow up with supportive action, write them anyway. Even though that person is not really giving you the support you need, by writing out the response you would have wanted to hear, you're giving yourself that love and support. Use each of the following lead-in phrases to write a response that would make you feel heard and supported. Feel free to add any additional comments that would make you feel better. I apologize, and then you complete the sentence. Please forgive me for, and then complete the sentence. I understand, and then complete the sentence. I promise, and then complete the sentence. I love, you are, you deserve. Say loving things at the end of the letter, and then sign it, from that person. After writing out the response that you want, imagine how you'd feel if you got that response and then write that out. By taking this important time to express the positive feelings you've generated, you'll become more centered and connected to your true self. By taking a negative experience and then generating positive feelings from it, then you'll no longer resist looking at your past. When you're able to heal, learn from and grow from your past, you're no longer attracted to situations that repeat the past. You're free to create whatever you want. By linking negative feelings to your past and generating positive feelings, you hold the power to remove the blocks and move on to create whatever you want. These seven lead-in phrases will assist you in drawing up and generating positive feelings to assist you in finding and staying connected to your true self. Take a minute or two to express each of the seven levels. Your love makes me feel, and then complete the sentence. I now understand, and then complete the sentence. I forgive you for, and now complete the sentence. I'm happy that. I love. I feel confident that. I feel grateful for and then write out with love and sign your name. By taking the time to express the positive feelings, you're filling up the emptiness left by feeling the negative emotions. When I begin to feel any of the blocks like blame, resentment, or judgment, I'll often write out my feelings to God. When talking to God, I always feel smaller and more vulnerable like a child. This is really what most prayers are. They're just a means to communicate your feelings to God and express your wants and needs. By using the feeling letter, response letter, and connection letter formats, you can deepen your connection with God and fill up your vitamin G1 love tank. Some people believe in God but feel betrayed by God. When this is the case, it's even okay to blame God. If anyone can hear your blame without feeling hurt or defensive, it's God. By forgiving God, you'll be free to fill up your vitamin G1 love tank. With practice, it gets easier to process your feelings. In the beginning, you'll feel relieved, but sometimes a little drained. This is just because you're not in shape. A little drained is much better than blocked. After a time, just like with healthy exercise, you'll not feel drained afterwards. One of the major reasons we remain blocked is that we have suppressed certain emotions for years. Sometimes the emotion we need to feel and release is an emotion that we don't give ourselves permission to feel. To release a block, we must give ourselves permission to feel all 12 of the pure negative emotions. Remember, 
All twelve negative emotions are healing and natural. They're just messengers telling us we're moving away from our center. They're important signals to help us find balance. By feeling pure emotions, you come back to yourself, but by feeling the blocks, you disconnect from your true self. After clearing one block, you may find that another comes up. At this point, you'll not be so troubled because you'll have experience within yourself the power to create what you want. Today, we see around us thousands of people who've achieved outer success and inner fulfillment. Although the tabloids are often full of tragic stories of the rich and famous, there are many people who have it all. They may not be super rich or famous, but they've learned to get what they want and they continue to want it. They have both inner and outer success. You too can have it all. The ideas of personal success are simple and easy to understand and can be put into practice immediately. You have the potential to create your destiny, but you must find it. Let these ideas of personal success help awaken you to who you truly are and assist you in claiming your inner power. You can be all that you are and fulfill all your true desires. The seeds of desire would not be in your heart if you didn't have the special potential to create your future. When you're true to yourself and in touch with your authentic feelings, wishes, and desires, you're connecting to your true self. The true self, our natural state of every person, is joy, love, confidence, and peace. These attributes are already present inside you. In a very real sense, the world you live in is a reflection of your inner state. How you experience the world and the situations you attract or that you're attracted to are mirrors of your inner world. As you take back the power to determine how you experience your world, the way the world touches you changes. Although someone or some circumstance may upset you, you still hold the power to bounce back and feel good again. To do this, you must remember again and again that although it seems like the outer world is making you unhappy, it's an illusion. By looking within and finding love, joy, confidence, and peace, you gain the power to attract and create in your life what you want. Make use of your opportunities and each day take a step closer to your goals. Always remember that you're not alone and that you're needed in this world. You are loved, and you do make a difference. God bless you. We hope you've enjoyed this program from Harper Audio. To order additional cassettes or to receive a complete catalog of Harper Audio and Cadman titles, please call us at 1-800-331-3761. That's 1-800-331-3761. Thank you.